for those that don't work with coral reef, coral reef are one of the most diverse ecosystem on earth, even when then uh, they uh, occupy only 1% of the area, surface area of the oceans. It's an incredible diverse ecosystem and it also holds other species as well. And it, have, um, an it has an important value in terms of e economy for um, the, the societies that live uh, in the coast. And just briefly, I wanted to describe the, the coral holobiont. Um, the coral is, is itself an ecosystem and it harbors a really diverse microbiome. Uh, they have bacteria, viruses, archaea, and fungi. And perhaps the best known uh, symbiosis is with the symbiotic microalgae. And today we'll be talking about, we'll be focusing in both the coral and the microalgae with our speakers. All right, and with that, I'm going to introduce um, our first speaker, Dr. Danielle Clark. Uh, Danielle is a NOAA Climate Change and Global Change Postdoctoral Scholar in the Wood Lab at the University of Washington. Her research focuses on the reef fish para parasites as bioindicators of environmental change. And today, she will talk about her recent work on environmental impacts on interaction between corals and their symbiotic algae. Please welcome uh, Dr. Daniel Clark. Daniel, you can share your screen now. Perfect. We, we can see it, Daniel. All right, excellent. Can you see the first slide? Yes. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Ali. I'm really excited today to talk about my research on coral reefs um, regarding dynamic symbioses that reveal pathways to coral survival through prolonged heat waves. This work is in collaboration with a number of other scientists, and it's been a really fruitful collaboration across institutions. Um, I'd like to note, if you're watching this live, please don't tweet the results. They're currently in press, and um, they'll be released and uh, advertised broadly soon. Before we begin the talk, I'd like to acknowledge the funders and individuals who have made this work possible. Working on a remote island in the middle of the Pacific is logistically challenging. And this research was made possible only by the efforts of the hardworking members of our Christmas Island Coral Team, our local iCareBoss collaborators, and our laboratory collaborators. I'd also like to dedicate this talk to Dr. Ruth Gates, who spurred a lot of this research and was an important voice for corals across the world. She was lost much too soon. As temperatures rise and more reefs are affected, it's increasingly important to understand when and how corals can be resilient to stress. This involves understanding coral responses to pulse stress events, such as El Nino warming, and chronic stressors, such as local disturbance. Chronic local stress is caused by human disturbance to the coastal environment. One type of chronic local stress is increased nutrient input, which can weaken coral resilience by causing nutrient imbalances, which can alter metabolic processes, or by disrupting the symbiotic balance. For example, a large influx of nutrients can greatly increase the number of symbionts within a coral. Although initially contrary to what you might think, this increase in symbionts can cause overcrowding and photo damage and can lead to symbiotic breakdown. Increased nutrient input can also change coral-associated bacterial communities that make corals more susceptible to disease. These chronic local impacts are often superimposed on climate warming, making corals even more susceptible in a changing environment. As Ali mentioned, an important aspect of coral resilience to stress is their symbiosis with photosynthetic dinoflagellates called Symbiodiniaceae. You may know members of Symbiodiniaceae as zooxanthellae, which was the common name used to describe them when they were first observed. We don't use this term too much anymore since it basically means small round brown thing and thus is taxonomically a little bit vague. Corals and members of Symbiodiniaceae form a nutritional symbiosis. The corals provide intracellular habitat and inorganic nutrients to the Symbiodiniaceae and in exchange the Symbiodiniaceae provide photosynthetic products to the coral. You can see some Symbiogeneaceae here in culture, 
as well as the pigmentation they provide to their coral host in the bottom right. There are many different members within Symbion Geniaceae that can form symbiosis with coral. Some symbionts are better partners, providing their host with large amounts of food, while other are more selfish, providing less food to their host. Thus, Symbiogeniaceae span the gamut from parasites to mutualists. There's a biological trade-off here too. Generous symbionts tend to be more sensitive to environmental disturbance, while selfish symbionts can stockpile nutritional supplies and survive stress. And before we move forward, let me clarify something quickly. In this talk, I'll use symbiont as a general term for symbiogeniaceae that associate with corals. While corals have a diversity of symbionts, including bacteria, archaea, and other unicellular organisms, saying symbiont is a bit less of a mouthful than saying symbiogeniaceae each and every time. Additionally, I want to mention that there are a number of other important factors that contribute to coral resilience, including host responses, local environmental variability, and the coral microbiome, just to name a few. However, in this talk, I'll focus on the symbiotic component of coral resilience to stress. In order to understand how symbionts influence resilience, we're going to have to delve a little bit deeper into the phylogeny of Symbiogeniaceae. Stick with me on this, I promise it will be important to understanding my results later on. Although this group used to be a single genus called Symbiodinium, molecular data have shown that it has diversity on the order of orders. Currently, the family Symbiodiniaceae is divided into multiple genera and several unnamed clades. Unfortunately, it is difficult or impossible to tell which genus a Symbiodiniaceae cell is using microscopy in most cases. They essentially all look like these little round brown circles we mentioned before. Therefore, we use next generation sequencing of the ITS2 amplicon as well as qPCR in order to identify and quantify Symbiogeniaceae sequence assemblages. We'll go into more detail about this in a bit. I want to focus in on two Symbiogeniaceae clades in order to give some context for my results. First, species within Cladocopium are generally considered ideal symbionts. In many cases, Cladocopium is the best genus of Symbiogeniaceae to have under good conditions. Because while Cladocopium are more environmentally sensitive than some other clades, they provide the most nutrition for their coral host. As an aside, I will note that the genus Cladocopium has a high level of phylogenetic diversity, leading to varying levels of symbiotic support, which is an important um, frontier in our research in understanding coral and symbiont interactions. But for today, we'll focus about the more ideal members of this genus. In contrast, Juristinium are considered heat tolerant symbionts. They're environmentally robust, have a lower phylogenetic diversity, and can be selfish symbionts. While Cladocopium symbionts provide most of their metabolic output directly to their host, Juristinium symbionts hang on to more of their energy and use it to repair themselves during stress. This research focuses on the trade offs of having these different Symbiogeniaceae genera during an extreme warming event. During warming events, coral bleaching occurs when the symbiosis between corals and their Symbiogeniaceae breaks down. As stress increases, Symbiogeniaceae are expelled from their coral hosts and the coral takes on a ghostly white appearance of a bleached coral. Since the coral relies on these symbionts for its nutrition, this puts coral in a very vulnerable state and puts them at risk of starving to death. However, if the stress subsides, symbiosis may be reestablished, either from a few remaining symbionts in the coral tissue or potentially from the uptake of new symbionts from the environment. If the stress doesn't subside within a certain window, the coral dies. This window for recovery varies among coral species and also within coral species due to a number of factors, including what types of symbiogeniaceae they have. To understand how chronic stress influences coral stress or coral bleaching during an extreme event, we tagged colonies and looked at how survival was linked to symbiont communities and tracked how these communities changed over time. In previous research, we've seen increased symbiont sequence diversity, and this may provide adaptive capacity by giving the coral options, or it may indicate opportunistic invasion. So while we've seen that diversity varies with chronic stress, 
how does this translate to coral survival outcomes? And as I mentioned, to do this, we tracked coral bleaching and survival on Christmas Island throughout the 2015-2016 El Nino event. Christmas Island is located in, located in the central equatorial Pacific, directly south of Hawaii and just north of the equator. Although it's spelled like Kira Tamadi, it's pronounced Christmas because the TI makes an S sound in Kiribati. Here in the top right corner, you can also see the tags that we use so we would be able to come back to the same coral colonies before, during, and after the bleaching event. We tagged corals at multiple sites across Christmas's local human impact gradient. Before the bleaching event, our ecological monitoring sites spanned a gradient from some of the most degraded reefs in the world towards the north west side of the island to some of the most pristine reefs in the world with up to 80% coral cover. Christmas underwent an extreme heat stress event during the 2015 and 16 El Nino. It endured unprecedented warming that wasn't expected to occur anywhere in the globe until at least 2050. And this event was particularly strong in the central Pacific Ocean. In this map here, along the equator, right in the middle of that darkest of dark areas is where Christmas is located. And this El Nino event was part of a larger and longer global coral bleaching event that affected reefs worldwide. We leveraged this catastrophic event in order to investigate three hypotheses. First, we hypothesized that corals that survive would recover their symbiosis only after the heat stress had subsided. This may seem incredibly obvious to you and is in line with previous research that has shown coral recovery after conditions get back to normal. Secondly, we expected that baseline Symbiogeneaceae communities would differ between high and low disturbance sites. This is in line with our previous research showing differences in symbiont sequence diversity across a local disturbance gradient. And finally, we hypothesized that the Symbiogeneaceae community structure a coral had before the event would allow us to predict coral survival during the bleaching event. To give you an idea of the severity of this event on Christmas, Here's the extent of heat stress on Christmas, shown as degree heating weeks using the NOAA Coral Reef Watch metric. For context, coral bleaching can start around four degree heating weeks, massive coral bleaching can happen around eight degree heating weeks, and massive coral mortality is expected at 12 degree heating weeks. We observed more than twice that much heat stress on Christmas, nearly 25 degree heating weeks, surpassing a level of warming that was not expected to occur on any reef in the world until 2050. This warming instigated a mass bleaching event on Christmas, resulting in approximately 90% mortality and causing a massive ecosystem transformation of the island's reefs. But fortunately, the story today is not all doom and gloom. In this story, I'll focus on the surprising resilience of one of the coral species in particular, Platygyra ryukiensis, or the brain coral. We used next generation sequencing in order pr to produce sequence assemblages of the ITS2 amplicon. In brief, we extracted the DNA from corals, amplified the ITS2 amplicon using PCR, and then sequenced this using the Illumina MySeq platform. Finally, we used PhiloSeq and Data2 in order to process these sample sequences and deduct what was going on. Additionally, we looked at quantitative PCR of Cladocopium and Durastinium Symbiogeneaceae as well as Platygyra corals in order to determine the symbiont to host cell ratios of each colony. This provides us with a density of symbionts within a single coral, indicating bleaching, as well as the proportional abundance of cladocopium and durastinium within each sample. So here's an example with photos from one coral colony, but this pattern occurred consistently within this coral species. And here, here is my favorite coral before the warming occurred. You can see that it is fully colored and that it is a happy, healthy coral. After two months of heat stress, 
when about 11 degree heating weeks had accumulated, this coral bleached. This was not surprising. That's quite a lot of heat stress, and we were seeing massive bleaching of many species across the reef. However, what was surprising was that when we went back after 10 consecutive months of heat stress to check in our corals, we found that despite the fact that the reef was still experiencing heat stress, this coral had already recovered its symbionts. This was unheard of. As far as we know, there's no documented instances where a coral can recover symbiosis while still under stress. And just to confirm and convince you that this was a true recovery, here's that same coral six months after the event with its normal coloration indicative of a healthy symbiosis. The field team has been back to Christmas multiple times since this last photo was taken, and this coral is still alive and healthy. We think this is a really exciting result because the ability of corals to recover from warming while still being subjected to the stress is really hopeful. As bleaching events become more prolonged and severe, this is a glimmer of hope for some corals. After observing this amazing recovery, we wanted to know what drives differences in coral resilience and survival. In order to show these results, I'm going to use a canonical analysis of principal components, or a CAP, which is a type of constrained ordination. Basically, this analysis takes multidimensional Symbiogeniaceae community data and collapses it down to a 2D representation of community similarity. The numbers on the axes are not important. What you are looking for is how clustered together these points are. Each point is the symbiont community within a single coral colony. And the closer points are together, the more similar their symbiont communities are. Also, the percentage here on the axis helps tell us how much variation in community structure is explained by that axis. You can see here on the left that coral colonies living at very high disturbance site cluster together, while the Symbiogeniaceae communities at the low to medium disturbance sites cluster separately. This difference between disturbed and less disturbed explains nearly 60% of symbiont community variance among coral colonies. This figure shows the results at the sequence assemblage level, but we wanted to further investigate how this mapped to Symbiogeniaceae genera. Here I show scaled human disturbance on the x-axis from low to high and proportion of durastinium on the y-axis from zero, completely dominated by cladocopium, to one, completely dominated by durastinium. You'll notice that the number of colonies dominated by durastinium increases significantly with human disturbance. So we know that symbiotic communities differed along this gradient, but how did this affect coral survival? Here, time is on the x-axis and the symbiont to host ratio is on the y-axis, where higher ratios indicate baseline symbiont densities and lower values indicate bleaching. We found that corals that started with cladocopium in blue before the event did indeed bleach, but they were able to recover their symbionts before the conclusion of the event, whereas corals dominated with durastinium before the event didn't show bleaching when sampled two months into the event, but they ultimately died. This resulted in a differential survival where corals in highly disturbed areas that were already dominated by heat tolerant symbionts had a 3.3 times lower survival rate than those that were not. Now, wait a minute. If you remember back earlier in my talk, I mentioned that durastinium are considered the heat tolerant symbionts, and we might expect them to fare better under stress. We think that this counterintuitive result is due to lag effects. Durastinium can hang on and survive during normal bleaching events, but the nutrition it provides to its host is lacking. Therefore, having the quote unquote ideal cladocopium may allow the coral to bolster its energy reserves and response capacity enough that even if the coral does bleach during the event, it is able to persist long enough to survive even in an extreme event like this. Our research on this is ongoing. These results have important implications as our field considers interventions to support coral resilience such as seeding heat tolerant corals on threatened reefs. These results certainly do not discount the possibility of these sorts of interventions, but they do urge a caution to explicitly consider potential unintended consequences stemming from these ever longer and more intense warming events. Finally, I will note that these somatic communities were stable a year and a half after the end of the event. 
This was surprising as we had expected that coral colonies would revert to their pre-bleaching symbiont communities, as has been frequently seen in other locations such as the Caribbean. We are continuing to monitor these corals to understand whether this stability persists and what implications may exist for future warming events on Christmas. In conclusion, we found that coral can re-establish symbiosis before heat stress subsides, which is a glimmer of hope for coral survival and resilience. We also found that local human disturbance can indeed influence coral symbioses, and that the resulting symbiodiniacea communities may drive the probability of coral survival. The research I've shared today demonstrates that threats on coral reefs are increasing, but that a moderate amount of protection may help some corals survive. Therefore, it's important to consider a strategy that includes not only limitation of carbon emissions at a global scale, but also mitigation of stressors at the local scale. Thank you very much, and I look forward to answering any questions during the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Danielle, for for excellent presentation. It's no doubt really interesting system, the, the Christmas Island. Um, anyone had a question for Danielle? I'll start with one, because um, it's really interesting that what you were saying that the, the symbiont continue after 1.5 years. Do you guys keep sampling that system? It's it's a steel stay oxide. Temperature keep increasing, so. Yeah, so we, um, Julia Baum at University of Victoria, who established this site, um, their team is continuing to sample on Christmas Island. And so, um, Yes, we're continuing to sample these corals to see what would happen. Like I said, we were quite surprised they hadn't switched back at that point. Um, so we'll see what happens over the next couple of years with those systems. Wonderful. Any other question for Danielle? Michelle, go ahead. You can open your mic yeah. and ask. Thank you, Ale, and thank you, Danielle, for the talk. Um, I was just curious, so you showed the platygyra that bleached and then recovered during the heat stress. Mm -hmm. um, so was that the entire platygyra population or was that a few individuals? I'm sorry if I missed that. Thank you. Sure. It was platygyra that are located at less disturbed sites and we saw it quite frequently at those sites. So like I said, I just showed the one image of that, but we saw it pretty consistently at our lower disturbance sites. We also saw some evidence of this in other coral species, particularly Favides pentagona, um, but I didn't have enough time to get into that, that aspect of the story today. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Any other question for Danielle? All right, um, thank you, Danielle. So thank you. we we'll continue now with Kate. Uh, Dr. Kay Quickly is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences in Townsville, Australia. Her research focuses on understanding the genomic basis of environmental stress and resilience in corals and the related dinoflagellate symbiodinium or symbionid CI. Uh, and today she will talk about her recent work on uh, crossbreeding to enhance thermotolerance in corals. Okay, you can go and Share your screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that is, uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. okay. It's not in presenter view, right? Um, I see it as a, yeah, I think it's in, pres yeah, yeah, it's in presenter view. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's, I'm, I think there's people joining in from Australia as well. So um, I'll just, you never really know where, where everybody is in these talks. So as Ali said, I'll be speaking today about some of the reef restoration um, interventions that we're currently looking at in the reef recovery and adaptation program at the Australian Institute of Marine Science in Townsville. And specifically, I'll be talking about some of the breeding work that we've been doing with corals sourced from different parts of the Great Barrier Reef. So, um, oops, oops, sorry. <laughs> 
So um, why do you love coral reefs? And I'm assuming if you're here this morning or this afternoon that um, you do in some way care about reefs. Potentially it could be for the food that they provide um, or potentially for the economy. If you have a business, um, especially here on the Great Barrier Reef where I am, the reef contributes over $3.9 billion to the Queensland economy and supports at least 30,000 different jobs, as well as protecting Queensland's very important coastal infrastructure. Or maybe you think more about reefs for how beautiful they are. Coral reefs, especially in Australia, hold very deep, almost unquantifiable social cultural values. And as a World Heritage Site, this is something that we need to be thinking about protecting for the global population. However, time is running out for reefs. Queensland's reefs and indeed reefs around the world are under pressure from increasingly warmer seawater temperatures. And as seawater temperatures will continue to rise, corals will struggle and die from these higher temperatures. And recent thermal bleaching that we've had on the Great Barrier Reef, including 2016, 2017, and now most recently again in March 2020, show that reefs really are struggling in this time of change. And if we remain on this current trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, reefs globally will uh, continue to suffer catastrophic decline into the mid and late uh, century. So let's hope this video works. Um, so corals are complex animals that form symbioses with a range of different eukaryotic bacterial and viral species. And corals live in this relationship with eukaryotic dinoflagellates, which um, Danielle already nicely uh, introduced us to, um, zooxanthellae or symbiodinaceae. And when corals become stressed, um, in particular when seawater temperatures become too hot, the symbiosis between corals and dinoflagellates breaks down and essentially those cells are lost from the coral animal. And that's when we see corals turn this kind of ghostly white and this is what we call coral bleaching. So if the coral is left without the symbionts for too long, it effectively dies, um, it effectively starves and then dies. So there are many threats to coral reefs, water temperatures, increasing water temperatures being one of them. Um, but we also need to think about water quality, ocean acidification, um, and overfishing. However, climate change, um, as shown in the Outlook report published by the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, the governing body tasked with um, protecting and conserving the Great Barrier Reef, has said very clearly that climate change is escalating and is now the most significant threat to the reefs. So as oceans continue to warm, it will become harder and harder for corals to survive in their present state. So the Great Barrier Reef is a very vast ecosystem. There's over 3,000 um, contiguous reefs on the GBR and it roughly equals about the size of Italy. So it's a really big ecosystem to try to either conserve or potentially intervene in some kind of restoration method. Um, and certainly since these three rounds of mass bleaching, the Great Barrier Reef has lost a lot of coral, but there really is still a lot left to save. However, with strong action on climate change, water temperatures are um, projected to continue to rise and stay elevated for a long period of time. And this is particularly important when we think about um, natural adaptation rates on the reef. Will there be some point in which natural kind of propensity for adaptation will essentially run out given these increasing warmer, increasingly warmer water? So we really need to start thinking about potential ways of accelerating adaptation if needed. So as part of this reef restoration program, one of the ways that we're considering accelerating adaptation is it through a method called assisted gene flow. And this is one of about 43 different interventions that we're looking at in order to build resilience to future warming on the reef. So across the Great Barrier Reef, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but uh, the far north of the reef, um, shown here in red, 
is generally typified by warmer seawater temperatures. And as you move down the reef to the south, um, the central and southern region of the Great Barrier Reef are generally cooler. So that really allows us to think about if we go and collect adult colonies, shown here in these uh, little gray icons, um, if we go and collect colonies from the far north of the Great Barrier Reef where water temperatures are warmer or potentially collect their offspring, could we potentially move those individuals down to cooler temperature reefs in order to kind of anticipate this warming into the future? Another thing that we can do is essentially selectively breed or mix the eggs and sperm of colonies collected across this temperature gradient in particular ways in which we produce um, either larvae or coral juveniles that have uh, recombinant genotypes. So genotypes made up of individuals from different genetic backgrounds. And this is, um, this is essentially a form of selective breeding. So selective breeding is used in agricultural settings, um, kind of breeding facilities, and we can take these you know, very fundamental um, ideas um, from quantitative genetics to essentially try to selectively breed corals for particular traits of interest, whether that be increased heat tolerance or um, increased growth. It's just about trying to find the underlying mechanisms um, controlling the genetic basis of that trait. So I just want to take a moment here and kind of clarify that at least assisted gene flow in the way that we're talking about now is an acceleration of a natural process on the Great Barrier Reef. So the genetic information that we do have for um, a, few, a few species, uh, not all 450 that we have on the Great Barrier Reef, but we have some information for a few, suggests that gene flow is occurring across the Great Barrier Reef at least to some um, extent. So what we're trying to do is essentially harness this process that is already happening and essentially make it go a little bit faster given these rates of warming that we're now seeing. So um, in, at the end of 2017, we went up to the far north of the Great Barrier Reef and collected reproductive colonies from a reef called Tiju Reef. Um, and then we flew them back down to Townsville, which is um, where the National Sea Simulator is at the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences. And we went off and collected um, further colonies of the same species from a reef called Back Numbers Reef, which is um, in the central Great Barrier Reef. And we did this reproductive crossing that I was um, talking about before. So mixing the eggs and the sperm of these different um, colonies sourced from different locations on the Great Barrier Reef. And in particular, I probably should note that Tiju experienced extreme bleaching in 2016. And so these are effectively the bleaching survivors of that event. Um, so we mixed their eggs and sperm and we created a whole bunch of different recombinant genotypes in the form of different larval families. And we subjected the larval families to, oops, sorry, to a bunch of different temperatures and then we settled them um, to create coral juveniles. I think you guys call them spat over there in the United States. Um, and so if we just look at three of the different kind of cross combinations, we had Tiju by Tiju. So that's essentially a warm mom and a warm dad. We had Tiju by back numbers. So that's a warm mom and a cool dad and back numbers by Tiju, which is a cool dad and a warm mom. And then we took those um, juveniles that didn't have any symbionts yet and infected them with three different symbiont um, types that we have in culture here at, at Ames, um, A3, C1, and D1A. And C1 is generally pretty good under ambient conditions. So in non-bleaching events, usually provides a lot of carbon to the coral host. So it really helps um, baby corals in particular grow um, quite well at ambient temperatures. And then D1A, Trenchii, is generally considered a heat tolerant or heat resistant symbiont type. So we really wanted to set up kind of this combination of how will corals perform given these different genetic backgrounds and different symbiotic states. So then we looked, um, we had these juveniles, we put them at um, different temperatures to kind of see how they would fare for about three months. 
and um, we had a control temperature and an elevated, ambi uh, elevated um, temperature seen here in red. And we just tracked their survival, their growth, and the photosynthetic efficiency of the symbionts over time. And what we found was that the contribution of different host genetic effects and symbiont combinations really varied given the different traits that we looked at. And that probably most interesting for this talk, what we found is that if we had a warm parent, so if we had a parent that was sourced from the far north of the Great Barrier Reef, and in particular one that had survived mass bleaching, and paired that with a heat tolerant symbiont, so D. trenchii in our case here, that we were able to get 26 times higher heat tolerance of those juvenile corals when subjected to heat stress. So that's pretty exciting. And then we really wanted to see, okay, well, what does selective breeding actually do to the genetic architecture of these baby corals? So taking our reefs, our same reef, reef system that we talked about before, Tiju Reef in the north and Back Numbers Reef in the central region, we took the um, larvae, the aposymbiotic larvae at this stage, so no kind of contribution of the symbiont in terms of heat tolerance, and um, just the larvae that were at the, at the ambient condition in this particular example. And we sequenced individual larvae from each of these different families. And what we can see here are allele frequencies on the x-axis, um, after doing shallow whole genome um, or SNP sequencing, and we have density of these different alleles on the y-axis, where the red combination is the warm-warm combination, so having that Tiju mom and that Tiju dad. Yellow is having a warm mom and a cool dad, and blue is the cool dad and the warm mom, so the different kind of genetic contributions. And what we saw is that when we selectively breed corals and we produce these recombinant genotypes in their offspring, that not only um, were the expected allele frequencies different to what we would expect to get, kind of the null distribution of allele frequencies we'd expect to get under Hardy-Weinberg, um, seen here in black. These are the modeled, this is kind of the modeled distributions that we thought we should get given um, kind of given status quo breeding, we can see that they're quite significantly different. But probably more interesting is that when we compared the hybrid crosses, hybrids being um, crosses between different populations of corals, so the yellow and the blue, we can see that there's um, kind of the distributions of expected allele frequencies were different between the yellow and the blue compared to our purebreds in red. So that really suggested that not only are we creating kind of different genetic contributions, but we're creating novel genetic diversity um, in these different interpopulation crosses. So we were really interested in kind of exploring that further and kind of asking the question, okay, well, if we're creating more genetic diversity, where is this diversity being created? And so um, bioinformatically, we just linked essentially the SNPs that we found to the expected protein functions that they should have. And what we found was that, um, you know, a lot of the SNPs that were involved in separating um, these different families were involved in things that we knew were important about heat stress. And these were the 99.9% .9 significant SNPs. So it's really there were quite a lot of SNPs that are involved um, or that change, I suppose, during selective breeding, but it was very interesting to see that a lot of the really significant ones were the ones that were associated with canonically heat tolerant um, genes that have kind of popped up uh, paper after paper in RNA-seq studies and other um, studies looking at SNPs. So a lot of those proteins were involved in cell membrane um, formation, metabolism, immune responses. So essentially we're selectively breeding and influencing the genomic architecture of the offspring in ways that are associated with heat tolerance. So that novel genetic diversity and in important regions. So this was kind of shedding light on some of those physiological responses and translating into kind of the genomic architecture of the breeding. So um, that was kind of the pilot study and we went back the next year, went back to the far north of the Great Barrier Reef and um, collected again gravid colonies from three new reefs, 
And this time I really kind of dug into the satellite data and tried to find reefs that were not just hot during kind of a normal year, so a non-bleaching year, but were also quite hot during bleaching. So in the 2016, 2017 bleaching events to really try to find individuals that could um, produce heat tolerant offspring. So again, we collected these corals, brought them back to the CSIM, did the reproductive crossing to get these recombinant genotypes. Um, some photos of the, the little larvae here. Um, we cooked the larvae in particular experiments, but I'll just talk about the, the juveniles now. And just as the year before, we settled these juveniles and exposed them to a range of different symbiont types, C1 and D1A again. And this time we also expose the juveniles to what we call hot sediments. So these are sediments sourced from the far north of the Great Barrier Reef, which should have punitively heat tolerant, naturally heat tolerant symbionts living inside them, given that symbionts, Symbiodinaceae, um, kind of have a very important part of their life cycle in the sediments um, free living. So they're a really important kind of reservoir for heat tolerant symbionts. And we also exposed the coral juveniles to the selected strain of C1. So the selected strain um, was created over multiple generations of increasing heat exposure. So we took C1 years ago and through a ratchet experiment, continually increased the temperature until we got this selected strain of Symbiodinaceae which performs better at higher temperatures. So we wanted to see, could we kind of eke out continued or maybe another further degree of heat tolerance if we infected juveniles with this um, artificially selected strain. So we subjected the aposymbiotic larvae of all these different genetic combinations, as well as the juveniles of the genetic combinations with the symbionts to um, heat stress as we had done the previous year. And what we really found was that um, both larvae and juveniles varied in their responses to stress um, in both their survival rates, their growth, and their photosynthetic efficiencies. And we've also been looking at gene expression to try to tease apart the relative contribution that um, kind of acclimatory processes have on heat tolerance as well as more um, adaptive or fixed effects um, might have on uh, heat tolerance. So uh, watch this space. Uh, that work is currently being completed. So it's all well and good, I suppose, to do these kind of experiments in the CSIM, but we really wanted to know, well, what happens in the wild when we put these assisted gene flow corals out into the wild? Obviously, if you're working in an experimental facility, you're kind of unintentionally exposing um, these juvenile corals to artificial selection within the husbandry condition. So we really wanted to see what happens to these traits in the wild. So um, in previous years, doing this kind of reproductive crossing, um, we had not seen, you know, kind of the classical signatures of trade-offs. So we were looking for potentially decreases in growth with increased survival under temperatures. Um, and previously we had done some reproductive crosses from the far north of the GBR with the central colonies and outplanted them at a central reef, um, in particular Orpheus Island. And when we did this, we didn't really see any trade-offs under ambient conditions, so in a non-bleaching year. Um, previous work doing crosses between the central and the southern reefs and then outplanting them in the southern reefs did suggest that maybe there would, there would be a trade-off um, between growth and survival when outplanted to the field. Um, and so this kind of really spurred us to, again, take these corals, put them out into the field, and we're currently um, finishing up that work from outplanting them into the central reefs. So um, we should have that, that soon, but um, kind of, I guess, spoiler alert, um, there doesn't seem to be too many trade-offs in these classical, in the classical sense, um, when we look at things like growth and survival in an ambient year. So, okay, so we've kind of talked about northern corals having these um, particular genes associated with heat tolerance, but we also wanted to kind of think about how long it would naturally take 
these um, heat tolerant variants or genes associated with heat tolerance to move throughout different reef systems and that would inform whether we needed this intervention or not. So if there are kind of particular genes in the far north of the GBR and I hope that I've convinced you that there are, um, could they essentially move to the central and southern regions if kind of left to their own devices? So in order to answer this question, I use passive particle dispersal modeling and chose 15 reefs in the far north of the GBR um, for particular criteria. Some of the criteria are that we, we know that particular reefs have these variants, and I chose another 10 reefs that had similar temperature and current profiles to these reefs with um, heat tolerance variants, and then another three reefs in the far north that we know are very important uh, larval sources for the rest of the reef. So I took those reefs and essentially released them um, in a modeling environment throughout the GBR um, and essentially asked the question, where would those larvae go? So you can see kind of the path, the cloud path of these different larvae released from these different reef sites. And if we look at this inset, we can see these, um, the lighter peaks, this is a density plot, the lighter peaks are essentially where larvae are probabilistically supposed to end up. So what we can see from these um, light peaks here is that on average, most of the larvae released from these 15 reefs in the far north are really staying quite local. So they're kind of being captured by the currents and staying up or being shot off into the, the coral sea, which is just off over here. So that really suggests to us that there is potentially given the kind of biophysical parameters of the far north of the GBR, quite a lot of local retention in this region. So although there are heat tolerance variants up there, they're not really getting to the central or the southern regions as much as we think that they uh, potentially should be. Okay, so they're not really traveling that far, but again, if left to their own devices, how fast could we expect these genes to move throughout um, uh, environments and fix within local populations. And it's really important to talk about fixation because most of the time needed for adaptation occurs at this fixation step. So genes getting, um, getting to particular environments and then becoming a part of the local gene pool and being passed on um, in subsequent generations. So to answer this question, I used a different kind of model, which is a 2D stepping stone wave expansion model, which essentially treats genes moving through an environment as if they were waves. And I chose two different selection coefficients, 0.05 and a, a higher uh, coefficient, 0.1, and essentially measured the centroid distance of all the 3,000 reefs on the GBR to calculate a rate of gene spread in kilometers per generation for the northern GBR, the central GBR, and the southern GBR. I'll just focus on this kind of this higher selection coefficient. And what we can see, so this is the, the northern GBR in the, uh, in the top panel, and then the central GBR, back numbers reef, and then Heron Island, which is down in the southern GBR. Um, and what we can see if we convert these rates, the kilometer per generation, to an actual distance is it would take on average about 30 generations just to travel about 4.6 kilometers. So that's essentially the distance from Tiju Reef to its nearest neighbor reef. So quite, quite a bit of time. And if we wanted to ask, well, how long would it take for those heat tolerance alleles to essentially escape from the far north region, um, it would take about a thousand generations. So quite, quite a long time. And when we looked at the rates at, in the central and the southern reefs, they were also um, similarly uh, would take a long time. And interestingly, the rates in the central GBR are a bit faster because of the way that the reefs are positioned. So kind of the rate of spread is dependent on the proximity of different reefs to each other. Um, but overall, you know, the um, take home message is that it's gonna take a long time. And you might think, well, these fixation estimates seem uh, quite long, but they're actually quite in line with um, theoretical estimates that Ronald Fisher um, found in, 1930, in his kind of seminal work in 1937, because we really need to think that we are trying to essentially influence a process that generally occurs over evolutionary timescales 
but we're just trying to fit it into a time where these warming rates are accelerating really quickly. So just to kind of, I guess, a, a brain check that these estimates are within what we would normally expect. Um, and so just to kind of take, take this home is that, you know, where would these heat tolerance variants go? Well, without some kind of intervention, they're not going to go very far within this limited time scale that we're now talking about. So assisted gene flow so far, we've tested um, over 11 reefs on the Great Barrier Reef over 12 degrees of latitude. Previous work by Dixon et al. has shown that if you take aposymbiotic larvae and cross them, um, you can get 10 times more survival from those larvae at higher temperatures. And if you take those larvae and essentially infect them with heat tolerant symbionts, not only do you get 26 um, times greater survival under heat stress, but when we looked at the heritability, in particular the narrow sense heritability under um, high temperatures, there was a very high um, heritability coefficient. So that really suggests that um, this, the speed for which selection should occur is quite high for this particular trait, which, is, um, which bodes well if we're looking at kind of accelerating um, adaptation on short time scales. So how do we find these reefs? Um, how do we find reefs across a reefscape that's so massive that it's the size of Italy? And it might seem like going and searching for these uh, resistant colonies is a bit like searching for a needle in a haystack. And kind of the paradigm that we've been thinking about so far is, can we find heat tolerant adults to essentially create heat tolerant baby corals? But potentially, we should think about this in a different way and essentially ask, well, if we have information about heat tolerant offspring and we know about their genetic architecture, how can we therefore predict where these heat tolerant adults should be? So I'll save you the modeling um, and I'll just kind of get to the, the point, um, but using um, a different type Kind of a different type of modeling, a different type of approach, we found that essentially three environmental factors were very important for um, predicting where heat tolerant adults should be, and in particular heat tolerant adults that should produce coral babies that are good at surviving high temperatures. And these um, factors include high on average yearly temperatures, um, high fluctuation in temperature throughout a daily cycle, as well as highly variable thermal stress anomalies. So not just really hot water for a long time, so degree heating weeks, but there's a lot of variability within that degree heating weeks as well. So we use those um, three kind of metrics to essentially ask, well, where on the Great Barrier Reef are reefs like this? And we were able to locate um, about 100 reefs on the GBR that fit this profile. And in November of this year, we'll be taking the Cape Ferguson, the, the Ames boat, and collecting corals from these five reefs to essentially test the models and see, okay, can the models actually predict where these heat tolerant um, adult corals are? And will we be able to get um, heat tolerant babies from these corals? So uh, we'll, we'll be able to tell you if the models worked in, uh, in December. So essentially, this is what a one degree uh, warming looks like. We're already in one degree. And we know that we have another you know, 0.5 of a degree baked into the system, given the amount of carbon that's already in the atmosphere. So you know, there is still resiliency. There's still populations out there on the GBR that are creating um, heat tolerant offspring. But we need to really think about the range of methods that we're using in order to combat climate change. And these interventions, um, although promising, are really just to buy us time while we reduce our impacts due to climate change. And it's really going to take kind of the trifecta of very good management, these development of the restoration interventions, as well as really strong action on climate change to save reefs. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you to all the funders and all the people that have been involved in this research and I'll take your questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kate. It's amazing, amazing work. Um, and really shed some 
hope for the Grabberry Reef. Um, there's a few questions in the chat. I'm going to read um, a couple of them. The first one is from Lorraine Ling, and she's, she asks, is the selected sea strain the one from Borger et al. 2020 from Madeleine Van Open Lab? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's actually quite a lot of selected strains, and so um, at that that year, we didn't really know of the different strains that we were testing which one was the best. And so Pat's work has shown that selected strain one and selected strain eight were really the best at um, kind of providing bleaching tolerance. So there's a difference between bleaching tolerance and survival, right? So um, he infected his larvae and he looked at um, whether those larvae would essentially lose their symbionts. So that's bleaching. And he found that selected strain one and selected strain eight were the best at kind of preventing that bleaching response. And I used in that particular um, example, selected strain one, and so in, in juveniles. So now that kind of provides evidence that selected strain one is both good at helping corals not leach, but also helping corals not die under heat stress. So that's pretty exciting. But yes, it's the same kind of concept of exposing symbionts to increasing temperatures. Awesome. There's a second question from Dr. Steve Palume. He says, hi, Kate. Did the volcanic symbiont line enter corals well even after being cultured for so long? That's a great question. Um, so we have, you know, been looking at the um, kind of how is the symbiosis, how is the infection rate maintained when you actually start to select for different traits? So um, the short answer is no. Um, the selected strain generally infects much more slowly and at lower densities. And, you know, this has kind of been the issue is that the selected strain performs very well by itself. Um, given a range of different um, photophysiological measurements. But when you try to get it into the coral, it just doesn't seem to want to behave. Um, and so we've actually just finished some nanosims work trying to understand, okay, if we're selecting for heat, how are, what are the trade-offs with symbiosis? And there really does seem to be some key trade-offs that are occurring when we're selecting for heat. Um, so uh, unfortunately, it seems like the symbiosis um, changes. It doesn't become at, it's not as good of a symbiont anymore. So it's a bit more selfish. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking at kind of the details around that symbiosis now. All right, we have one comment and, and a last question. Um, so the, 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 the comment is from Lorraine. And she says, given how physiologically different algae in the hospital are from algae in the water column, it would be good to compare the difference in survival of larvae or juveniles infected with your evolved sea symbiont versus a heat tolerant sea algae isolated from leaching survivors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah. then the question, uh, oh, sorry, you, you wanted to say something? Um, Lots, lots of things there. Um, yes, I mean, the so the water column symbionts are generally in taxa we don't normally see in symbiosis. So I kind of think of the water column symbionts as the real free living dinoflagellates. So for some reason, they've never really developed a propensity for um, kind of getting in symbiosis or being stable in symbiosis at kind of adult life stages. So um, these were the sediments. So the, the community that's in the sediments is quite distinct from the community in the water column. But yes, you're absolutely right. It is, um, we are looking at how survival varied between the kind of juvenile community um, that was taken up from the sediments compared to these artificially selected strains as well as C1 and D1A. All right, and then the last question is from Ruben Nino, and he asked, I have a question for Kate. Is there a genetic bottleneck metric considered, assuming the sister gene flow work was made in the wider scale? Um, so I guess, are you asking if selective breeding is creating a genetic bottleneck, essentially? And, you know, that's a great question, because if you look at the literature, the conservation literature about what 
potentially breeding can do. Um, yes, you know, I think there's a really nice examples in Puma, in the Florida Everglades, when you breed them, when you have a small population and you breed them, you're essentially creating this genetic bottleneck in your population. Um, and that, I think that really underscores why we need to do this breeding work now while we still have millions of colonies to selectively breed from. We don't want to get to the kind of critical mass where we have 20 individuals or 100 individuals that we're breeding and then we're going to create these genetic bottlenecks just because we have low population size. We want to do this breeding when we still have really big effective population sizes where we can maintain that genetic diversity and not try to create it. And I think that's why the molecular ecology work was so interesting and why I was like, whoa, yay, okay. Um, and that we're creating more genetic diversity than we're losing. So, you know, that's a real concern is we're gonna make these crosses, we're gonna make these recombinant genotypes and yes, they might be um, more heat tolerant, but we're eroding genetic diversity at the same time. And that's why the molecular ecology paper was so, I guess, hopeful for me in that we are demonstrating that we're actually creating more than we're losing, um, which will be very important for adaptation rates, um, you know, kind of moving forward. All right. Thank you so much, Kate. It really gives, I think it gives some hope to everyone so thanks for sharing all right and now i want to introduce our last speaker from the day um, his name is dr luke thomas uh, luke is a research associate at the oceans institute at the university of western australia and also at the australian institute of marine science sciences in Perth, like opposite coast of Kate. His research focuses on the genomic basis and genetic connectivity of resilient and bleached coral, corals. And today he will talk about his work on climate adaptation on corals of Northwest Australia. Uh, Luke is here, but it's 6 a.m. for him. Thank you so much, Luke, for um, joining us today. So Athena will play uh, his talk that has been recorded yesterday. Ali, are you seeing this okay? Yes, no, not duplicate. I can see the presentation perfect. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, thank you to Alejandra for inviting me. I've lived in Australia for a few years now, but grew up in California. So uh, the Cal Academy and science in California is close to my heart. So I'm uh, very thankful to be here, to be given the opportunity to present some, some new research that we've been um, conducting in Northwest Australia uh, using whole genome sequencing techniques um, to better understand the adaptive capacity of these populations to, to rapid environmental change. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to briefly acknowledge all of my collaborators on this project. Um, a lot of these data were collected prior to COVID lockdown. Um, so the story has been continually evolving. Um, so I haven't had too much time to work on it over the few months, over the past few months, as everyone can imagine. Um, so thank you to my colleagues for their patience as the story slowly develops. So when you think about coral reefs in Western Australia, it's important to note that the, the systems are quite different to the stepping stone archipelago um, of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, in Western Australia, we have a number of geographically separated, um, demographically isolated coral reef systems. So they start in the south in a temperate tropic transition zone around Geraldton. That's the offshore Hoopnabralis Islands. And then moving north to Shark Bay and Ningaloo Reef, then coming around the corner, getting into the inshore turbid Pilbara reefs, and then quite a large gap um, due to a lack of suitable habitat around the 80 mile beach region, and then into the Kimberley, um, the inshore Kimberley with the dynamic tides and the uh, uh, extreme intertidal corals. And then there's the series of offshore oceanic atolls in the Kimberley region. Um, and it's these at offshore atolls that are the location of my, my field site for the last couple of years. Now we think about the offshore um, atolls in Northwest Australia, it's really a tale of two reefs. Um, Scott Reef in the north um, has a history of disturbance 
So it was severely impacted by uh, the 1998-99 bleaching event, and then more recently in 2016. Um, and in addition to these history of bleaching, um, Scott Reef has also been exposed to quite intensive fishing pressure over the last hundred, hundreds of years. Um, it's quite close to Indonesia, so we get subsistence fishers from Indonesia coming down to, to fish Scott Reef. So although the coral reefs have been in quite good condition in between these bouts of bleaching, the fish stocks um, are quite, um, quite low. And then to the south, a couple hundred kilometers, we have the Rolly Shoals, and it's a very different story there. The Rolly Shoals are a series of three um, atolls that have avoided bleaching in the past, thankfully, just because they've just been slightly south enough to avoid the warm water tone associated with El Nino events. Um, and they have, or they occur in a marine protected area in Australia. So there is strong compliance um, enforcement. And so they have extremely healthy, healthy fish populations as well as really dynamic, beautiful reefs. Um, so here's some footage from the Rolly Shoals that we recently collected, just showcasing the, the beautiful, um, luxuriant coral communities and the, uh, the fish assemblages that these healthy coral reef systems support. Um, so unlike Scott Reef, you get schools of bumphead parrotfish and, and large Napoleon wrasses and sea cucumbers and giant clams and, and species that disappear from these highly, um, highly harvested sites are just flourishing at the Rolly Shoals. So it's a, a unique, wonderful paradise um, and probably one of the last strongholds for, um, for coral reefs in terms of, um, you know, pristine sort of environments. And so the Rolly Shoals are isolated um, in space and time. So they sit out on the edge of the continental shelf. They're, you know, hundreds of kilometers from any any other uh, coral reef system um, and population genetic data um, from corals and fish based on microsatellite markers mostly show that uh, you know they are demographically isolated as well so they, they display strong strong genetic differentiation with other reefs um, offshore and inshore systems and that signal of isolation is present in the in the DNA of the coral so when we sequence um, proper tenuous to high coverage, um, we can calculate uh, Tajima's D, which is a, an index of, of neutrality in a way. Um, so a positive Tajima's D suggests a, an absence of high frequency or low frequency alleles is a classic sign of bottleneck. So when we compare Tajima's D, the Rolly Shoals to Scott Reef, those box plots you see in the top right there, we see this skew in allele frequency spectrum in um, in, in Rolly Shoal samples, excuse me, suggesting a strong bottleneck. And when we infer effective population size through time uh, using a high coverage individual, we can show that, um, you know, the population sizes were largest about 150,000 years ago. Um, and this coincides with the last interglacial. So although they're isolated now, um, 150,000 years ago, the story was quite different. And the coastline occurred along the 125 meter contour. And so corals were much more, much more connected along the WA coastline. But as um, sea level increased, the Rolly Shoals became progressively more and more isolated. Uh, and so we can track effective population size through time and see a similar signal where population size was largest about 150,000 years ago, and then a gradual decline to today around the 20,000 um, individual size mark. So they're isolated in space and time, they're bottlenecked, they're, up, they're on their own out there. Um, so in the context of climate change, this is quite worrying because um, the, the Rolly Shoals can't rely on the influx of larvae from the north that are perhaps more heat tolerant um, to cope with climate change. They're, they're reliant on standing genetic variation in the system. And fortunately, um, there's lots of temperature variation out of the roller shoals. And so we'd expect to find wide variation in thermal tolerance. So lot, lots of standing variation in this um, trait that's likely facing uh, intensified selection. So there's three atolls. Um, they form pronounced lagoons. The, the reef crest on low tide becomes exposed. And so there's only tiny channels to access the lagoon on low tides. 
and this restricts any flushing with the living environment. So although the reef slope is regularly bathed in cool ocean waters, the lagoon environments heat up throughout the tidal cycle. Um, so we see much more, much more variable temperatures in the lagoon environment, um, and there's much less current. So it's a very stagnant, warm, um, warm place to, to live. So we wanted to test if we could detect signatures of selection associated with survival in this marginal environment. Um, and so we focused on Clerk Reef because the temperature differences between the slope and the lagoon are most pronounced at this reef. And we collected coral colonies from two lagoon and two slope habitats um, and sequenced them on ANOVA-seq using Xterra Flex library preps to about 5x coverage. So we also included some samples from Scott Reef slope um, environment that we are going to use as outgroup for population grant statistics and also to put um, put the, the Rolly Shoals data into a broader sort of context. And because we only sequenced samples to about 5x coverage, we decided to restrict our analyses to um, genotype likelihoods. Um, and so we're able to generate about 5 million um, data for about 5 million variant sites spread across the genome without actually hard calling SNPs. So all of the analyses you'll see from this point on um, are generally based on genotype likelihoods. And uh, we focus on a cropper tenuous because there's a great um, assembly available for this species, courtesy of Ira Cook um, and colleagues at JCU and ANU, and also um, because it's widely distributed and lots of groups are working on it. Um, in an attempt to improve the assembly that um, the cropper tenuous assembly, we we um, used a program called RAGU, which anchors the scaffolds of the tenuous assembly to the chromosome scale assembly for a cropper millipora. Um, that Zach Fuller and colleagues recently released. So we're able to get chromosome scale resolution of our data. Now we could also take those shotgun sequence reads and map them to the complete um, mitochondrial genome, about 18,000 base pairs long, and then extract consensus sequences. When we did this, we found strong divergence across the mitochondria, and then only, only a single haplotype was shared between Broly Shoals and Scott Reef samples. Um, Based on the nuclear data, um, we were able to use a program called NGS Admix and assign individuals from where they were collected with 100% accuracy. So samples clustered strongly by reef, reef location. And there's a PCA plot uh, just to show you this as well. Um, and then there, there are two outlier individuals that we had to remove. A strong clustering of Scott Reef and Rolly Shoals, was, which is what we expected to find. Now, despite strong differences between the reef systems, um, when we were looking at within Clerk, the Rolly Shoals, we found strong or high gene flow across habitats. So our samples from lagoon and slope environments were completely admixed, and there's no evidence of any heavy um, population structure across the reef. And despite these strong environmental differences between, um, between the slope and lagoon environments, there was no, um, no differences in symbiont community composition either. So we originally just took the, the shotgun sequence reads and mapped them to ITS2 haplotypes, but I wasn't able to get subcladal resolution using this technique. Uh, so if anyone's got any ideas, I'd be, I'd be really interested in chatting about this. So instead, we just decided to generate some metabarcoding data because we know that clade C is predominant in WA and we wanted a bit finer resolution, than just the, the clade or genus level comparison. But there was no difference. So although inshore, Populations in like the Ningaloo area have very different um, symbiont communities. Uh, there's no difference between Scott Reef Rolly Shoals or within the uh, slope and lagoon environment of Rolly's either. Now, we wanted to search for signals of selection to this warm lagoon environment. Um, and so to do this, we use population branch statistics, which is an FST based measure but polarizes. Um, FST, so it, it's it's the magnitude of change at a given locus relative to the change um, of the other two populations. So we calculated branch lengths in FST using 100 kb windows across the genome. Um, we did this pooling samples by habitat, so slope versus lagoon. Uh, we did it by for the pairwise comparison, so slope lagoon, slope one, lagoon one, slope two, lagoon two. Um, so we we tried a bunch of different um, ways of pooling the data. And regardless of how we pooled the data, we identified a single locus that um, occurred in the top 
99.99% um, lagoon branch length windows. So effectively what we're looking for is a signal, um, like you can see with the, the diagram there, where um, effectively all else equal, we see this strong signal, strong branch length in lagoon populations that's not evident in the slope populations. And this outlier locus that we identified um, occurred on chromosome two. Now, when we zoom into this um, single outlier locus, we see that it um, overlaps several genic regions and several of these genic regions had homology to proteins of known function. Um, there were three, three genes that were um, linked in this, in this outlier locus. They tended to be involved in processes related to immunity and cell signaling. Um, so there were protein phosphatases in there, which are obviously involved in a number of cellular pathways. Um, like cell death and, and, and cell differentiation. There was some protein transport, um, protein transport proteins, excuse me, so like Golgi subfamily. Um, so protein transport from the Golgi to the cell surface. And then the largest gene in this group was fibrocystin, which is um, a homology to a protein expressed, um, or sorry, genes expressed in immune responsive cells and involved in regulatory phagocytosis. And then along the bottom there, you can just see that outlier um, window or locus, sorry, in progressively smaller window sizes. So 100 KB and then 10 KB and 1 KB step, uh, windows. So they just show the error around um, this outlier region using progressively smaller windows. So what we think we found here is a group of immunity stress response related genes that um, are closely linked and that seem to be under selection to the lagoon environment. Um, so across this region, we saw a coordinated increase in minor allele frequencies in lagoon samples. So these are heat mats. Um, X axis is the chromosome two position. Um, and then the Y axis is minor allele frequency. Each one of those points represents a different SNP. Um, you can see a increase in or a shift effectively in the lagoon samples to the to increasing minor allele frequency that we don't see in the reef slope samples from either Scott Reef or Rolly Shoals. Um, and so plot A here just illustrates that is just a density, hist uh, density histogram um, showing an increase in minor allele frequencies in the red and orange, so the two lagoon sample sites. Um, FST across this region was also quite high, although important to note, it wasn't, it wasn't the top FST outlier. Uh, and so the orange and the red are for the two different lagoon slope comparisons. Um, and then there again is the uh, 10 kV window um, and then the two lines are just for the two different comparisons. So the signal is strong in both, both lagoon and both slope sites that we, that we sampled. And then along the bottom there, um, for the two slope sites in blue and purple and the two lagoon sites in orange and red, we've got some classic um, population genetic statistics, um, like Tajima's D, Fan Wu's H, um, and Pi, and consistent with a shift in, in derived alleles in lagoon samples, um, we see dips in Tajima's D and Fan Wu's H. And then Pi seems to be slightly higher across this region um, in lagoon samples, but I'm not really sure what to make of that. So what's next? Well, we're double checking and triple checking these data to make sure it's not an artifact, um, but everything so far makes us believe that it's actually a really strong signal. Um, and now the idea is to test whether this signal is consistent across other extreme marginal environments. Um, and we're testing this across Australia. And the idea is to then develop a, a multiplex amplicon based assay that we can then just target these adaptive regions or adaptive loci um, and sequence you know, thousands of colonies at, uh, really cheaply because we don't need whole genome coverage. We just are interested in a few interesting sites across the genome. And all of this is, um, help, is, is done in order to help us uh, manage these systems better. So can we identify broodstock um, for restoration initiatives or for perhaps just identify areas that harbor high levels of heat adapted alleles that we can protect um, 
So how can we incorporate these genetic data into um, to better management corals in the future? And so we are on a quest for naturally heat tolerant alleles or populations, excuse me, in Australia. And um, to do this, you need a portable system that you can measure bleaching resistance in situ. So we developed a CSIM in a box, which has taken the, ex the expertise um, from the National Sea Simulator over in Townsville and essentially put it into a 16 tank weatherproof, just press go uh, heat stress system. So this was inspired by a lot of the work um, that I was involved in, in Steve Palumbi's group at Stanford and, uh, you know, that Dan Barshis helped pioneer in the early days in OFU. Um, and so we're following similar protocols that other groups using these techniques are around the world so that hopefully the data are all comparable. Um, so this was some footage from a recent trip to the Rolly Shoals where we sampled colonies from the lagoon and slope environments across the three atolls. Um, so we sampled a cropper tenuous. We took nubbins um, in Nelly bins back to our mothership, the RV Salander, where we then fragmented the nubbins and placed them in tanks, uh, let them acclimatize overnight. Not a bad place to work, as you can see. Um, and then the following morning, we hit them with acute heat stress. Um, so akin to putting someone on a treadmill and, you know, at max speed where we're hitting these corals hard with with heat stress, 35 degrees Celsius um, for a couple hours and then letting them cool. And then we measured uh, the bleaching response the next day. Um, and what we found is that um, lagoons, lagoon samples have much higher bleaching tolerance than slope samples. Um, so they bleach much less at 35 degrees Celsius. And in addition to this, there's lots of variation on the reef slope. So we see lots of variation in bleaching resistance out at the Rolly Shoals. Um, so the next steps are taking these to other reef systems, Scott Reef, and then over the top end. I um, mean, currently this, this system is being deployed around uh, the GVR as well. So on that note, um, I'd like to say thank you um, for your time and happy to take any questions um, if, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke. I, I believe he's here. Luke, are you there? Are you? Yeah, I'm here, Ale. Hey, nice. Thanks for Welcome. having me. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> um, I had a question. So uh, I'm interested in hearing a bit more about those three genes you mentioned there in the chromosome two. You guys are planning to run some experiments 